No, I have to tell you, it was about a month after we had gotten back to the Midwest from the Southwest. And I called down to the property and I got Hanks on the phone. Hanks, security. And I spoke with him and I told him that we had our permissions now, uh -huh. we had our footage, and I thanked him for being so loyal to his company. Uh -huh. He did go above and beyond and it was nice to see. I wanted Hanks to know all was okay. He listened for a minute and then he said, Yeah, I remember you and your crew, and I want to tell you something. If you guys come back, you're still not getting onto the property. They truly are the greatest generation ever. When they do their jobs, they do their jobs. When they show up, they get it done. God bless them. Welcome to Studio 502 here in the mid-mid-west. In today's podcast, Vaguely Enforced Rules, moved into an entirely different direction after we began to outline the stories we wanted to tell today. Initially, this is going to contain stories about neighbors burning leaves on non-burn days and people that don't pull over when the paramedics or an ambulance or a fire truck is trying to get by. There are some silly and nonsensical rules out there, and I can't wait to talk about those sometime, but that's going to be another podcast coming soon. So today I'm going to retell some extreme and somewhat amusing stories, I guess you'll be the judge of that, around a few vaguely enforced rules which took place while shooting a documentary a few years back. This is the Life's Learning Curve Podcast. I'm Paul Hart. Stand by. This is a story of a documentary I helped work on a few years back based in Alamogordo, New Mexico. It was heavily copywritten uh, because this was a company or a corporation that had been around the United States for over 100 years. And they were very protective of their slogan, their logo, that type of thing. So we knew we were not going to use that in our production. But pretty much, we had full access to what we asked for from the remaining family members. Permissions were granted through attorneys and releases were signed. We had an agenda in our day-to-day -day shoot schedule. And off we flew to Alamogordo, New Mexico. You guys are good to go. Our home base would be a location shoot for our first main subject and it was a small home in Alamogordo. We carefully took proper angles to make this small house look larger. We used different lenses and things that would make our primary interviewee, uh, the great granddaughter of this famous family, look like her setting might be in the ballroom of a big hotel or something. And we did pull that off pretty well. I'll call her Mrs. Beverly Tucker for our podcast. She most definitely understood her family's role in the community and the nation and the world. My pleasure to meet you. She was eloquent and very articulate in her interview and delivered to us what we needed. In one sitting, we got great stories. We got detailed new information that immediately validated what we were doing. With this interview, we had something new and unique and a solid story and a foundation that we could live on. When we wrapped for the day, we were quite happy with our results. But something went terribly amiss, terribly wrong during principal photography. And we had hoped and prayed that Mrs. Beverly Tucker did not realize what was really happening. What is that noise? So let's backtrack. We did have permission to use that home in Alamogordo, New Mexico that day. But the owner had casually, vaguely mentioned some things about our time there. Number one. Number one. Do not turn on the air conditioner and more than two lamps at the same time, because you might trip a circuit breaker. So we ran power from the next door neighbor's homes to power our lights and equipment, thanks to Bill and Tony. Number two. Do not block the sidewalk with your vehicles because, well, they might get towed. Number three. And finally, the sewer pipes the outgoing sewage from the house had tree roots growing through the line, so if you have to use the bathroom, go somewhere else.
Now as soon as Mrs. Beverly Tucker arrived, we were glad to see her. She looked wonderful and spoke very clearly. Hello, gentlemen. Very nice woman. She asked to use the bathroom to check her makeup. But apparently, Mrs. Beverly Tucker did more than that. So during our interview with the eloquent and articulate Mrs. Beverly Tucker, we began to hear subtle sounds. Sounds of water backing up, overflowing from the nearest bathroom commode. Without going into greater description, you can imagine what other human senses were triggered that day. What is that? I remember one of our crew subtly went into the water? bathroom and tried to manage that situation, but it was too late. The situation was already managing us. Oh, no. We wrapped for the day and Mrs. Beverly Tucker left, knowing that she'd helped to further her family's legacy. It's funny because our production goals were solidly met that day and exceeded, I'd say, in the primary shoot and we were very happy about that. However, we did encounter what I feel was the great equalizer of any situation, good or bad. Backed up sewage. Boy, did we clean up. We really had to clean up. Each day after that, we continued. We got B-roll shots. We worked on secondary interviews, which made the Alamogordo house experience become more and more distant. And that was a good thing. When people saw us and our crew in town, they'd ask us what we were working on, and we'd say things like, uh, well, I can't tell you right now, but it certainly smells like a winner. Or we'd say, we're working on a documentary that's just overflowing with content here in Alamogordo. We were trying to be clever. We were just trying to survive that situation. What are you shooting? That's how we chose to deal with the entire Sewer Roots experience. You know, it's funny because later that week, we completed three more of our secondary interviews with great ease and with minimal time and appropriate plumbing. It all works. And action. After a fairly smooth week of production, we finally came to our last day of shooting these would be the B-roll shots that would help move the documentary by providing a connection to the narrative, lots of color, lots of fanfare, visually stimulating stuff. Our final day of shooting, we approached the man sitting at the entrance desk selling tickets to the museum. Now I had to tell you, we had been working in what I call retiree country. This area of our country in the Southwest was one of the places in America that people had come to enjoy the beautiful weather, sunny days of retirement. And some of these people still chose to work. This was the case for the gentleman we were about to encounter. As I got close enough to his desk to see his security badge, it said, Security Employee Hanks. H-A-N-X. Hanks. Now, to describe Hanks a little bit, Hanks was this guy who was distinguished looking older man. He had short cropped hair and he had glasses and a, a glare that could stop a plane mid-flight. Absolutely a retired gentleman. He wore a dark blue polo shirt and khakis and he wore them with pride. He appeared stoic and serious to the long line of ticket buyers. I'm sure it helped all the visitors understand that this museum and all the grounds there were a place of security, no nonsense, and respect. Thanks. You betcha. We stood in line and finally we made it to the front of the line carrying our camera, carrying our lights and our cords and crew. And we explained, Good morning, sir. We're the film crew and we're here. We're for the documentary that's being shot. We were told to check in with you here at the front gate at 10 a.m. And it's 10 a.m. right now. Here are our names. There was a pause. And he glared at us, and he looked us up 
and he looked down. And he had no response. He didn't say anything. It was uncomfortable. Maybe he didn't hear, so we repeated ourselves. We saw a clipboard nearby with a list of names, and we suggested maybe he could check the clipboard for our names. But he didn't, and he laughed. Ha! <laughs> you guys are not on any list. You gotta buy a ticket like everybody else. Well, you can't just come in here. Thanks for security. Sure, we can buy tickets if that's what we're required to do. We're the production crew, like I said, here for the documentary. And he said, I don't care if you're here to caddy for Sammy Sneed. Buy a ticket or leave. So we looked at one another and didn't know what to think. So I said, can you please check your clipboard one more time, sir? And he finally did. He looked for 10, 15 seconds, took a big breath and said, Yeah, your names are on here, but it don't say what for. You're not getting in, partner, especially with those cameras. Now, we had just come across the man, Hanks, Hanks. who would be the perfect person to protect your property or business if you were in business. Hanks, he's the guy. Hanks. Although maybe not, because if you had somebody coming to visit you, even if they were on the list, you probably wouldn't let them in. Nope. But my point is, he took his job very seriously. Hanks was applying his own vague rules to the situation. Rules are rules. We stepped out of line and immediately stepped away from the entrance and called the eloquent and articulate Mrs. Beverly Tucker. But there was no answer. We tried the company foundation committee headquarters, but again, there was no answer. Now this is before DSLR cameras were on the market. Now a DSLR camera is like a 35 millimeter still camera. It looks like a still camera, but they shoot great video. This is just before then. We had these cinema cameras. So I thought I'm going to take my cinema camera, I'm going to break it down, take off the handles and accessories so it appears to be a little bit smaller, not as large looking. The result was this still camera look with a massive lens and possibly at the gate, it could pass through Hanks for a high-end still camera. Hanks, nope. Then we thought for a while and... Switch my shirt with me. We decided we would do something. We swapped shirts. We swapped hats with each other. Where we broke out sunglasses yeah. and put those on and even blobbed some sunscreen on a couple of our noses. We were gonna go in incognito. So every six or seven minutes, we would send in a crew member in disguise and he would pay and enter the museum. Our security man, Hanks, at the gate, H-A-N-X, didn't recognize us through our sunglasses. I'm your guy. He did question our guy with the camera, though. Seeing he had a large camera, he asked, Uh-huh. That's a pretty big camera. You're not going to shoot any professional photos today, are you? No, our cameraman answered. Uh-huh. Which was the truth, because we were there to shoot motion video, not stills. Uh-huh. And eventually, we were all inside the museum and grounds. We're in. All right. At last. We're all in the park. Now all we had to do was to go about walking around the park, the grounds, the storage buildings, and shooting everything from our shot list that we needed for the documentary. So the five of us did so. It was fun, kind of, because we didn't have the large bulky lights. We used natural light, which in the end turned out to look much better with the project we were doing. We worked and shot things on the list for three to four hours, and there was a large group of people attending that day. This was a very popular destination. So we were working around a lot of these people and trying to stay out of the way. We got to our final shoot, which was the house that the person that owned this company many, many years ago, around the turn of the century, he had this house built for himself and his wife. They had traveled to Europe a lot. 
brought back a lot of artifacts and this house was built with materials from Europe so there was tiles from certain countries and vases and, and beautiful ornamental things and uh, that's what made this mansion kind of important to our documentary it was a part of this gentleman's life story so we wanted to take some shots of it because it was in the narrative and we did so. We got inside and we waited until the groups of people pulled to empty various rooms so we weren't getting in their way. We waited patiently. We went into the largest room in the house which was the ballroom. And in the ballroom, of course, that would be, if you just picture, the, if you say the word ballroom, it's something grand, it's something big. And this was, it was a huge fireplace beautiful tiles and large ornamental pieces in furniture that looked like something pre-America uh, back in those years. Very nice. We were taking video of that, but the ballroom was so large that a stationary shot or a series of stationary shots were not going to do it justice. The only way it would look good is if we did some sort of a camera tracking shot uh, in that particular room. And a tracking shot is basically when you have a camera and it moves, it slides left or it slides right. That, that way you can kind of see the depth, you can kind of see the motion. So I grabbed the camera from the camera operator, did the very best tracking shot I could handheld. Later on I could take it into the computer and I could take the instability out of it and make it a little bit more stable as I tracked left. There I was, taking my shot with the broken down camera that looks like a big camera, but like a big still camera, as I mentioned. All of a sudden I heard behind me going on a couple of voices. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there were older sounding voices and one of the gentlemen said, Oh, look at that camera, that's pretty big. That's a pretty big one. And the other guy said, I'm not sure he's supposed to be here. Said, I don't know, I think we better call this into Hanks. And with that, I thought to myself, oh no, not Hanks again. Hanks, you betcha. I kept my eye on the security guard as I was shooting things. He walked into an office, so I knew where the security guard office was. And he was on his mobile phone. He called, uh, must have called Hanks. Hanks here. I just kept working until finally I had all my shots done. I didn't have a lot to do in that particular room. And then we were done in the house. We we're going to work our way outside. So uh, checked off the list. And that's when both of the security guards for the main house approached me. And I get a tap on my shoulder. The gentleman says to me, older gentleman says to me, What's that? And I said, Well, it's a camera. And he said, What is it? And I said, Oh, it's a video camera. I'm shooting video with it. And he said, It looks kind of big. And I said, Yeah. I said, And I gave him the model of it. I was shooting with uh, Canon back then. I, I said, It's a Canon. Gave him the model number. And he goes, Oh. And he says to me, You're going to have to turn that camera over to me. It's mine now. And I said, Well, I can't, I can't do that. I said, This is stuff I've shot for today inside of here. And he said, That's a professional camera. You can't shoot in here with that. And I said, Look, I, I, I can show you. Let me back everything up. I'll show you on the media cards what I'm shooting. I said, Let's take a look at it. And you know, on the media cards, you can see the instability of the setups. We're going handheld. It didn't look like a TV program on the playback monitor, uh, which was just an eyepiece at the time. What the? It just looked like bad video somebody shot with, you know, some a few seconds of stability. And then, you know, you go into the instability. And I really wanted him to see that so it, it didn't look like. But then at the, at the same time, I didn't want to lie about this, but we were stuck on this schedule. We had a week to shoot this. This was our last day. We were flying out tomorrow and our budget didn't permit us to come back. We were only there that day 
because this company and corporation had given us that day. They said, we need you to shoot on this particular day between this particular time. If you can arrange that, you can shoot on that day. So he said to me, come into my office, sit down, have a seat. And I thought, oh boy. So I did something I normally never do. I didn't go into his office. I went out the back door like all the other visitors had done. And what I saw was the very last thing on our shot list, which was the back patio. Now the back patio led up to this inlet of water, a huge lake, and made with these Italian tiles, oh, from Italy, obviously Italian, and, and uh, it was just gorgeous. So at that point I handed the camera back to the camera person and I said, get two very quick shots of this, which he did. I kept looking toward the back door and the security guards were not coming after us for some reason. So we turned the camera off and we were beginning to leave the back porch or patio. I heard a voice from a distance come out the back of the house and I hear, I see him. There they are. Get him. Now, in other podcasts, you've heard me use this type of terminology before. I don't know why people are trying to get people. I don't know if this is influenced by films or movies. Get him. Um, you know, it's like you have to announce what you do before you do it. That was famous in the Austin Powers movies. Before he'd hit somebody, he'd yell, karate chop. All right. So these guys came out and I heard, there they are, get him. <laughs> so I see you. We looked at one another and we thought, let's walk away. Let's not run. Let's just walk casually away. And what we had to do was check one more building on grounds. So we began to walk across the grounds, not the sidewalk. And as we walked, we were about 100 yards, 150 yards away from the main house. And I was telling the cameraman about what happened inside the house and how, you know, something got followed up in the instructions or whatever, but they were acting as if we weren't supposed to be there. And the cameraman turned around and looked and he said, oh my gosh, they're chasing us. Now I looked backwards and I saw the following. I saw two, I don't know, retired guys, 65 to 75 maybe, in security uniforms, the same two guys from inside, and they're walking across the grounds and they're trying to walk quickly. But on the grounds, there's tree roots and these tree roots are sticking out of the ground. They couldn't even mow the grass there. And, and uh, we could, people could walk across the grounds. It, it wasn't illegal to do that or not, right? And they had to help one another step over these roots. <clears throat> and I looked at my friend and I said, I can't do this to these guys. I said, they're trying so hard. So I turned around and against the producer's wishes, went back and I spoke to the first guy, the guy that had talked to me inside. And I said, look, I said, I can really appreciate what you're doing mm -hmm. and and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I explained to him what our situation was. This is our last day. We had permission to do this. For some reason, our names didn't come up on the, uh, uh, they did come up actually on the clipboard, but not the reason why. And how we talked to Hanks at the front, couldn't get in. Hanks. And, the two guys stood silently. They were kind of out of breath from the walk chase that they just had with us. And they both, both of them really gave me the stink eye. You know, where they look, you look down, they look down their noses at me as I'm talking, as they were out of breath. And they still held on to one another. And I thought, I, I hope they understand. I hope hope they know I'm trying to be a decent person about this. <laughs> well, it, it was okay. I mean, they both just nodded their heads and turned around and went back to the house to be security guards. And I think they decided that they had done the best they could do. But, you know, the larger story was 
There really should be more people doing things like this, taking great value in their jobs. A lot of people do. They love what they do and it shows. Now, these are guys from the greatest generation ever, that generation uh, that uh, World War II came from. They went through the Depression, et cetera. And if they went to work, by golly, they went to work, you know, and they did their jobs. So I had to admire them. On the way out, individually, we walked past the entrance area where Hanks was, and he was still there. Goodbye, sir. Because they were going to close in about 30 minutes. Good day. And as we left, we didn't try and sneak out or sneak by. We all, every single one of us said, goodbye, see you later. And Hanks said, see you later. Have a nice day. See ya. I'm not sure he knew it was us. You know, once again, sunglasses, uh, shirt change. I don't know. Maybe he did. I don't know. And then our camera guy came by with a big camera. And he said, uh, see you later, Hanks. Used his name. And Hanks looks at him. And he goes, yeah, have a good. And there was silence. Ooh. Ooh. But, you know, it was all okay. Nothing became of it. We went out to the parking lot, took apart the equipment. Done. Put it all back together in the cases. Well, organized effort, ourselves guys. a bit. Talked about our evening. We were going to go back. We were going to look at the footage we shot, the dailies from that day. We were going to make sure we had everything. Then we would do reconvene here, back here in the mid-Midwest and figure out what we would do next from there. But we had our primary footage for the documentary. See you back home. Here's a little footnote to that. About two weeks after we were back in the Midwest, we got a phone call, or the producer, I should say, got a phone call. The phone call basically said, uh, it was from the foundation that we had shot at, and it said, you now have permission to come shoot in our grounds and museums. You can have full exposure to everything. That's the way it goes sometimes, though. In the end, everything was approved. It was an authorized documentary. It was edited, cut, and put out, and it did very well. So we were happy with our experience. We got a good story out of it. In our podcast today, our security guard friend, Hanks, was an active agent of change, and he enforced some vague rules. Well, at least to us, they were vague rules at the time. Our names were on that list to enter the grounds, but it did not say what for, and Hanks told us so. He stood his ground. Hanks was the guy that kept that business safe, secure, and no nonsense. He was the golden goose, the guy that kept it all together on staff. Now I have to tell you, it was about a month after we had gotten back to the Midwest from the Southwest. And I called down to the property and I got Hanks on the phone. Hanks, security. And I spoke with him and I told him that we had our permissions now. Uh -huh. We had our footage and I thanked him for being so loyal to his company. Uh -huh. He did go above and beyond and it was nice to see. I wanted Hanks to know all was okay. Uh -huh. He listened for a minute and then he said, Yeah, I remember you and your crew. And I want to tell you something. If you guys come back, you're still not getting onto the property. I really have a great deal of respect, not only for that man, but for all the people who lived through the Great Depression, World War II. They truly are the greatest generation ever. When they do their jobs, they do their jobs. When they show up, they get it done. God bless them. For life's learning curve, and life's vaguely enforced rules. I'm Paul Hart. Life's Learning Curve podcast is put together by producer Paul Hart with assistance by Tom Saludos, Jack LeClaire, and S.T. Dog. We're mixed by Bob Horn, Technical Director Heidi Cerner. 
As always, music and audio assistance by Riley Hart. Visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.buzzsprout.com. In today's show, some voices were digitally enhanced for entertainment purposes. As always, don't forget to choose the like on Facebook or subscribe on Apple Podcasts. I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with more stories from Life's Learning Curve. Oh, 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 oh,